Oh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and talking about a cool technical framework we developed to help optimize digital experiments. And the work is motivated by use cases in digital experimentation. And uh, some of them are behavior change campaigns um, that we conduct at uh, CVS Health. Um, so I would like to first introduce um, yeah, myself. You already heard I'm a principal data scientist at CVS Health. And then this is Reed, our main working force a data scientist also at CVS Health. And uh, also, uh, we have a project team. Um, this uh, include our uh, senior manager, Mariam, uh, lead director, the business uh, sponsor, uh, Jason, and also our two sponsors, Dan and Francis. And also, I wanted uh, to thank our uh, collaborators who helped motivate the initial work um, that uh, motivated uh, the development of this novel framework. They are Yan Xian, who was a data scientist in CVS Health in 2021, and also Shu Ti, um, another business partner. Okay, so here is the uh, outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'll give some overall motivation and the intuition of the new framework we developed. And then I will hand over to Reed, and uh, he will talk, uh, walk you through in detail the background, the methods, um, the new development, um, overview, results, and applications. And also, uh, we wanted to uh, just uh, talk a little bit about a new Python package that we are building uh, to auto-piloting uh, contextual multi-arm bandit models, simulation, evaluation, and their usage. Okay, so here's a take-home message. So I wanted everyone to take at least this message home <laughs> after this talk. So um, contextual multi-arm bandit is an effective method for optimizing recommendations and improving personalization in an efficient way. Yeah, so the problem uh, we are often facing in digital experimentation is to match eligible users with a set of actions, such as a set of different ads, a set of different offers, to optimize for business outcome, to maximize for rewards, and uh, minimize for regrets in an efficient way. Contextual multi-arm bandit is a personalized version of multi-arm bandit. And it's not a new technique. But what is new here is how we frame our business problem into a technical problem and fit our unique business problem within a general framework based on contextual multi-arm bandit. I'll just jump to one more slide here. Okay, so this one. Yeah, so basically, oh, sorry, not this one yet. Next slide. Yeah, okay. So one of the motivating example, so here I'm only talking about a toy example and a fake example, because this is for company proprietary information. Uh, so for example, we have visitors uh, to Amazon, the shopping site, and uh, we have a bunch of ads to show to each visitors. And each ad is about uh, uh, applying for a different financial services like a credit card or um, uh, a debit card offer. And then if someone successfully convert and uh, apply, we give them um, like a gift card of $10, $30, $50. And we only have a couple of slots to show such as. So the cost has opportunity cost, have the dollar cost, and also have cost um, our customer satisfaction, because uh, think about if we 
uh, keep showing to our customers the ads they don't want to see, then this may uh, annoy them and uh, disrupt their um, disturb their shopping uh, purchasing experience, right? So we wanted to optimize given a state. So the state here is uh, at a given point in time and uh, at the contextual um, status of the user with uh, uh, user's uh, features like profile, profile demographics and uh, their shopping history and uh, show them the action from a bunch of uh, um, different uh, eligible actions so that uh, we can uh, pick the next uh, best action to show uh, to them at the next time point to maximize our business outcome such as uh, CTR click-through conversion and then we can we will continue iterating this whole process until we reach the final optimal. So contextual multi-arm bandit uh, will make this whole process as efficient as possible. And uh, also, I wanted to uh, point out here, uh, we also can uh, incorporate constraints uh, for the overall, re uh, overall rewards and also overall uh, regrets. Yeah, and uh, because of the nature of the problem, think about the state as our data, think about actions as also um, other part of uh, prior information, and the rewards um, is our posterior based on the current data and the prior. So this is naturally falling into a Bayesian framework. Okay, so I will hand this over to Reid, who will walk us through in detail. Cool, thanks. All right, so taking a step back from contextual multi-arm bandit, uh, let's first start off with an overview of vanilla multi-arm bandit so we can kind of build up this knowledge base and then actually understand what contextual maybe is. Um, so before I dive into this, can I get a quick show of hands? How many people here are actually familiar with vanilla multi-arm bandit methods? Okay, a, a couple. All right, cool. So like Lee showed in the previous slide, uh, all these multi-arm bandit methods, vanilla or contextual, they fall under the general umbrella of reinforcement learning, right? So in reinforcement learning, you have a state, or you have an agent, right? This agent is in some state. Um, it has to select some action. Once it does so, it observes a reward. And the objective of this agent is to learn some policy such that you can optimally select actions in order to maximize cumulative sum of rewards and minimize regret, right? That's reinforcement learning. Multi-arm bandit, the vanilla case, is a simplification of this general reinforcement learning framework in that you ignore the state, right? So now you're in this setting where you're just trying to pick actions that give the best reward and you have to come up with some strategy to optimally do that. Um, to make this a little more concrete, you can think of an example that's shown in the cartoon on the bottom right here where you quite literally have a multi-armed bandit that's pulling, let's say, five different slot machines, right? And the bandit doesn't know how much money is going to be returned from each of these slot machines. And so this bandit has to, at each point in time, pick which slot machine to pull from. And the objective of the bandit is, of course, to maximize winnings. So the problem here that the bandit has to solve is what's called the exploration exploitation trade-off. Right? Of course, in the beginning, the bandit has no information whatsoever, so it's going to randomly pick slot machines to pull from. Then as we have pulled a couple times, it's gonna, now it has some data to work with, right? It sees maybe slot machine three gave us some money a couple times, slot machine one gave us nothing a couple times, right? It gets this data, and now the question is, what do we do with this data, right? We can use this data and say, you know, the data is telling us that slot machine three is best, so maybe we just pick that 100% of the time. But that's not good, because what if you just got really unlucky with slot machine one, because it's a small sample size, but in reality, if you kept pulling it, maybe it gives you something better. And so, this kind of highlights why we need to balance between exploring unknown actions that might have a really high reward versus exploiting what the data is showing us is the best action at this moment in time. Because we'll never actually know the ground truth 
And so we can never take a purely exploitative strategy. We always need to be exploring to some degree in order to ensure that we don't get stuck in a local optimum. Um, OK. So another way you can think of these MAB algorithms is kind of um, you know, analogously to A-B testing. You know, if you were to try to solve this, um, you know, this slot machine problem, you could also take an approach like A-B testing, right? Instead of doing this MAB stuff, you could just say, okay, we're gonna run an experiment, and if there's five slot machines, we're gonna pull each one 20% of the time, we're gonna do it a thousand times, at the end of it, we'll run some analysis, get a p-value, check for statistical significance, see which one is the best, right? And you could do that, and that's fine and good, and there's plenty of business situations where this is desirable, right? If you have a really critical business decision, you need some metric for statistical significance, you have stakeholders that are really tied to important KPIs. Um, in that case, A-B testing is a fine methodology to use. I'm sure you all are familiar with it. Um, but in a lot of cases now, there are situations where there's a high opportunity cost. Um, you desire more continuous optimization, automation, something of that nature. And in these settings, MAB can provide you with these things and actually provide advantageous uh, qualities and better outcomes generally than A-B testing because it allows you to kind of dynamically optimize, right? A-B testing, you're just, you know, you set your allocation at 20% a piece for 1,000 iterations and you don't change that, right? But you could see after maybe only 15 iterations that maybe slot machine one is really bad. But you're going to keep pulling it because that's the way you designed your experiment. Multi-arm bandit can use that information in real time and say, all right, this slot machine doesn't seem to be doing so well, so we're going to kind of ease away from that and move in favor of the one that does seem to be doing well. Not ignore it entirely, because like I said before, you always need to be exploring. Um, but it allows you to dynamically adjust your allocation to each of these actions. So that was a quick high-level overview of like conceptually the problem that multi-arm bandits are designed to solve. So now I will very briefly go over uh, some of the common implementations for, for these vanilla multi-arm bandits, the first of which is epsilon greedy. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. It's a very straightforward strategy where you set some hyperparameter epsilon, which is generally a small number. And with this small probability epsilon, you select a random action, right? This is exploration. And then with high probability one minus epsilon, you make use of all the data that you have and you select whatever you think is the best action at that point in time, and that's exploitation, right? And so this hyperparameter epsilon controls the degree to which you explore versus exploit. Um, so this is a very straightforward algorithm. It's a nice baseline to have, um, but we can do a lot better than that with more intelligent ways of navigating this exploration exploitation dilemma. And one of these ways is the second class of algorithms called upper confidence bounds. So I'm not going to go into the mathematical details of any of these, but uh, the high level overview of what upper confidence bound algorithms do is they calculate two things for you. The first thing is an expected reward associated with each action. The second thing is a confidence interval associated with that expected reward, right? So now you have you know, how much money you think the slot machine is going to give you and how certain are you about that prediction, right? And now the way the algorithm selects actions and navigates the exploration exploitation dilemma is instead of always selecting the action with the highest expected reward, it actually selects the action with the highest upper confidence bound, as the name suggests, right? So you could imagine you might have slot machine one with a very high expected reward, but you're very, very uh, you know, confident about that prediction. And you have another slot machine with a slightly lower expected reward, but you've sampled from it far fewer times, and so you're far more uncertain about it. So you have a wide confidence, confidence interval. The upper bound on this slot machine is actually higher than the upper bound on the other slot machine, despite the fact that the expected return is lower. And so this algorithm would actually select the latter of the two or the, the one with the lower expected reward but the higher upper confidence bound, if that makes sense. Um, so it's kind of approaching this exploration exploitation dilemma with optimism and picking the action with the most potential upside at any point in time. So that's how this one works. 
The last algorithm for vanilla multi-arm bandit that I will discuss is Thompson sampling. This is a cool approach, and what this does is it represents the expected reward of each action with a beta distribution. And initially, it's a uniform prior, so they all start out as flat lines, right? That's what this, um, this graph is here, right? Everything's flat, we have no information. Then we start sampling. And the way we select actions is we simply sample from all of these distributions, pick the action that yielded the highest sample, play that, observe a reward, and then go back and update the, uh, the parameters of these distributions. And then over time, as we sample, play actions, observe rewards, if we iterate through this process, we begin to collect data about all of these actions, and we can begin to form more robust um, you know, shapes for these distributions based on you know, how we update the parameters. Then you take this one step further, and as you sample and sample and sample, you begin to get more and more confident about the shapes of all of these distributions that represent the expected rewards associated with each action. So, this kind of reflects the idea that we're getting more and more confident in our uh, predictions. And the way this navigates the exploration exploitation dilemma is through sampling, right? Like, for example, in the middle graph, um, you know, you can see that the blue curve is clearly, clearly seems to be the best action at this point in time. Um, but that does not mean that we're going to uh, play that action at every given point in time, right? It's entirely possible that we could take a sample that's on the far left tail of this blue distribution and a sample on the far right tail of the yellow-greenish distribution. And in that case, we would play the yellow-greenish the yellow greenish action instead of the blue action. And that's um, our form of exploration in this setting. OK. So that was an overview of vanilla multi-arm bandit methods. I will briefly pause here. That was probably a fire hose of information. And if anybody has any questions or if anything is unclear, um, yeah, speak up. Any questions? I guess one question. Sure. Uh, are there any sort of uh, like optimality uh, criteria that you use for selecting the various methods? Or are these all heuristics that maybe work in different contexts? That's a good question. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, in practice, what we've done is just test multiple and see which one fits our use case best. Um, I can't really say if there's a, you know, a set of criteria that you should you know, look at. And if you check these boxes, you use upper confidence bounds. If you check these boxes, you use Thompson sampling. Because they do all kind of do the same thing. It's just a different way of doing it. Um, in general, it appears that Thompson sampling and upper confidence bounds, they give very similar performance in almost all use cases. In general, I think Thompson sampling might be slightly superior by like a hair. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, there's no set of like strict criteria that need to be met for each one. Yeah, the uh, their uh, studies showing uh, use cases uh, that favor uh, either the upper confidence bounds or the Thompson sampling. Yeah, definitely both of those are known to be superior to epsilon greedy. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, for sure. Cool. All right. So that was vanilla multi arm bandit. Now let's move into contextual multi arm bandit, starting with motivating why we need to even introduce this contextual component in the first place. So in order to understand why we need contextual multi-arm bandit, we need to first understand the shortcomings of vanilla multi-arm bandit as well as A-B testing. And those shortcomings are highlighted in the following hypothetical example. Suppose we are running an email campaign in the healthcare space in this particular example, and we need to assign one of k subject lines to each individual, right? It's an email campaign, so everybody's going to receive an email. First thing they see is the subject line, so we need to pick a subject line to assign to each of these emails. How do we do that? Well, before we even discuss how we do that, let's assume we have two people. First, you have Sally, who's a healthy, single, 25-year-old woman with no medical history. The second person is essentially the complete opposite. You have John, who's a 60-year-old married man. He has grandchildren, a number of chronic conditions, and a very long medical history. Vanilla multi-arm bandit and A-B testing fail to recognize or just essentially completely ignore 
the fact that these people are complete opposites. And what they do is they optimize at a population level, meaning that everybody in the population after this optimization process is complete is going to receive the same subject line, despite the fact that John and Sally are extremely different and it would be very reasonable to assume that perhaps the subject line that's best for John is not the same as the subject line that's best for Sally. But these existing algorithms do not allow you to, <clears throat> to capture that notion, right? Because they're context free. They don't know that John and Sally are different. So this is why we need contextual multi-armed bandit. Contextual bandits, as the name suggests, they incorporate this context and so they allow us to optimize at a personalized level instead of a population level. And now that we're optimizing at a personalized level, we can actually, in theory, give John the subject line that's best for him and Sally the subject line that's best for her. And those two subject lines are not necessarily the same, right? They can be different. Um, so this is kind of the, the core motivation for the entire class of contextual bandits. So to just re-emphasize some of that again, um, you know, a lot of what we're doing with our use case for this is around behavior change. And in order for us to maximize behavior change, of course, we need to optimize messaging and all these sorts of things. And of course, this can be extended to other use cases as well. But that optimization needs to happen, like I said, at a more personalized level, right? It's great to optimize at a population level. It's better than doing no optimization, obviously. Um, but you're still leaving engagement and performance on the table by failing to optimize at this personalized level. And, that, and that's where A-B testing falls short. That's even where M-A-B falls short. And that's why we need the contextualization. OK, so now that we've motivated the problem, I'll briefly discuss some of the existing methods in the literature that are commonly used for contextual bandits. Uh, before we do that, reinforcing again, this can, all of these contextual bandit methodologies sit within the general reinforcement learning framework. Um, with the vanilla bandits, I said before you kind of ignore the state. Now with contextual bandits, the state is back, right? So this is now like a, a full picture of the high level view of what contextual bandits are doing, right? You start in some state. Based on the state, you select an action. You observe a reward based on the state and action. You update the policy to select uh, the best action you can, and the objective is to optimize that policy in order to maximize rewards, right? And so there are a couple of different methodologies that do this in the literature that are pretty well researched. The first is from a paper called An Empirical Evaluation of Thompson Sampling. Um, disclaimer, by the way, I'm not going to go into any deep mathematical details on either of these papers. So if you're interested in that, um, take down the name of these papers. I highly encourage everybody to read them. They're interesting. They do a very good job of explaining all these things clearly. Um, the math is there. If you want to talk about the math after this talk, I'd be happy to have a private discussion about that. But that's beyond the scope of this. Um, but anyway, yeah, two methods here, Thompson sampling approach versus UCB approach. Um, what's common between these two is the use of a model. And the use of the model allows us to incorporate the contextual features, which we'll call some vector x. Right? So both of these are, have some black box model. They take in the contextual features x. And they use those features to output an expected reward associated with each action. And then based on that expected reward, we of course decide which action to play. So on the method on the left, the Thompson sampling approach, um, the model that's used here is essentially a Bayesian logistic regression model, where the weights in the model have prior distributions. And at each point in time, we sample from these distributions for each weight. We get an expected reward based on those samples. We update the parameters of those distributions based on the reward. And we iterate through that process over and over and over again. So it's kind of like Thompson sampling, but the sampling now happens on the weights of the model rather than simply the actions themselves. The approach on the right, a contextual banded approach to personalized news article recommendation. The actual algorithm here is called LINUCB, stands for Linear Upper Confidence Bounds. Um, and this is a very straightforward method. The name does quite a good job of summarizing what exactly it does. 
it's basically just a linear model that maps from these contextual features X to an expected reward. And in addition to that, it does some linear algebra to compute a confidence interval around this expected reward. And sim exactly the same way that the upper confidence bound vanilla algorithms navigate the exploration exploitation dilemma, this does the same thing, right? Now we just have a model that allows us to get more personalized and more expressive estimates for expected reward. But we're still doing the same thing, right? We're picking the action with the highest upper confidence bound. So those were some of the more uh, commonly known existing solutions for contextual bandits. There's a couple other interesting ones dealing with you know, deep neural networks that are beyond the scope of this. Again, um, if you're interested in those, we could talk after. Um, but that was some of what's in the, in the literature. What, what we've implemented is slightly different, and I will explain at a very high level, again, without going into mathematical details, I'll explain what we have implemented ourselves. So like those existing methods that I just described, we also leverage models. This is how we take in context and how we are able to optimize at a personalized rather than a population level. So we build a model that takes in whatever features from our context and outputs some expected reward associated with each action. Then based on this model output, we place individuals into cohorts, where each cohort is made up of individuals for whom a certain action is best. So cohort, cohort one is all of the people for whom our model says action A is best. Cohort two is all of the people for whom our model says action B is best, and so on. And then what we do with these cohorts is we throw a vanilla multi oh, oops. <laughs> You don't literally throw a vanilla multi-armed bandit at it, but you, you put a vanilla multi-armed bandit over each of these cohorts. And what that allows to happen is now you've divided the population into these sub-segments, and each segment gets its own bandit that can converge to a different optimal action. And so instead of now finding just one action that's best for the whole population, you can find an action that's best for cohort one, an action that's best for cohort two, and this allows you to optimize at a slightly more granular level than vanilla multi-armed bandit. So that was a really high level view of the algorithm that we implemented. And now I'll go over some of the results that were quite encouraging in our small proof of concept. So this slide here, the graph on the left, this basically just demonstrates that our algorithm is doing what we intended it to do. So the horizontal dashed line is vanilla multi-armed bandit. It's a flat constant line because vanilla multi-armed bandit is at the population level, right? Now each of the clusters, each bar corresponds to a different action, and each cluster you can see has a different optimal action, which is desirable, of course. Um, and furthermore, you can see that in each cluster, the optimal action does nearly just as good, if not far better, than vanilla multi-armed bandit. So in clusters two, three, and four specifically, you can see that the algorithm is able to identify for these cohorts a specific action that far outperforms whatever action vanilla multi-armed bandit would have suggested. And this is reassuring to us. This is showing us that our algorithm is, in fact, doing what we intended it to do. One thing to point out here, in cluster two, you can see that bar is outrageously high. And the reason for that is because cluster two happens to be a very unique group of people. That is, the sample size is quite small. And that's why we're able to get such an outrageously high success rate there. That's not standard for, for this use case. but. Um, yeah, the point to be driven home here is that each cluster gets its own action. These actions outperform whatever action Vanilla Multi-Armed Bandit chose. And the reason it's able to do this is, again, because, of, because we're splitting them into relevant cohorts um, that evidently have some meaningful information encoded in them. So now to more clearly show that contextual bandits do, in fact, outperform Vanilla Multi-Armed Bandits, as well as A-B testing. We've constructed a simple graph here that shows number of successes over time. And so as you can see, as we progress through time, contextual bandits do separate themselves from the competition. You see that light pink dot ends up being higher than all the rest, which is, again, reassuring us that our contextual bandits are, in fact, providing some additional value over uh, vanilla bandits. Uh, 
Let's talk a bit, a little bit uh, slower, more detail about this graph. Okay. Uh, so what each dot oh, is. Oh yeah, what each dot is. Okay, so I guess that's not entirely clear. Yeah, so the, yeah, the vanilla MAB dot, that's, hopefully that's self-explanatory, that's vanilla MAB. Um, the AB testing and the best AB test, that needs a little bit of explanation. Um, so AB testing, this dot corresponds to when you're actually running the AB test, right? So this is, if in your slot machine example, you've assigned, you know, 20% to each slot machine and you're running that, that's during that time. And then once you finish the AB test, you do some analysis and maybe you determine slot machine three is best. That's what this dot is, is measuring against. So that would be the success rate if you sent slot machine three to everybody. So we're comparing contextual bandage against vanilla MAB, the actual process of AB testing, as well as we're comparing it also against the actual best result from AB testing. And so that's kind of a meaningful distinction because this shows that contextual bandits not only outperform AB testing while it's doing that testing, but also it outperforms it even after AB testing has converged to whatever it thinks the best action is. Um, yeah, so that should summarize that, I think. So time add? one is the initial state, right? Yes. Okay, and by time five, we can see it's yeah. a clear. Um, yeah, time five is pretty clear. And then t equals six. Again, these, these times are kind of arbitrary um, abstractions from the real time. But yeah, by time five or six, um, it's pretty clear that contextual bandits separate themselves from, from the competition. And it's interesting to note that actually the closest competitor to the contextual bandits is the best, AB, the best result from the AB test. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's not a fair comparison because in order to even arrive at the point where you have this, you have to first go through that, which is the worst performing one. So, food for thought. Yeah, and also, of course, this result is based on simulation and based on the setting right. we use in the simulation. Yeah, right. so this may not be generalizable to other settings. Yes, that is a, a good point. This is, this was done through simulation. So, this is not real data. Um, of course, we trust our simulations, but do take it with a grain of salt. Any questions about any of this implementation stuff? Yeah, quick question. Oops. Yeah, go ahead. Um, wait, so for the Vanilla multi arm band, like, in theory, shouldn't that be as time progresses get up to like the best AB test, right? Because it'd be like recognizing yeah. it. And I don't know, maybe it's just specific to like the simulation. Yeah, in but, theory, you're right, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine as we, you know, if we extrapolate it a little further, it, it yeah. might get there. We cut it off kind of yeah. early for the sake of fitting it all on the slide. But, but yes, in theory, you're right. right. Yeah, Kira. So how do you decide on how how deep you want to go with this? I'm thinking about a parallel between determining a value for k and k means clustering. In one scenario, you know, you can say, well, every five people have their own bandit, right? Mm -hmm. but, but where do you stop, and is there a heuristic that you might, um, you know, put out there for, for folks to consider? So you're, you're talking about determining the number of cohorts that we're dividing people into? Because ultimately that translates to bifurcations within your experimental framework, yeah. and there's a complexity trade-off that you have to manage there as well. Yeah, the general heuristic that, that we've been using is to select the number of cohorts uh, to be the same as the number of actions that you're, you're choosing from. So like in the example of the email campaign that we were doing before, um, if you have like five subject lines that are candidate subject lines, then you'd, have, you'd run this model with five cohorts under the assumption that each of those cohorts would capture people for whom subject line one is best and then subject line two is best and that kind of thing because that's kind of intuitively what you would imagine or what you would hope that the model does. Does that make sense? Yeah. So how are you getting the data to train a model that does the prediction of which intervention would work best for the, 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 the um, individuals so that you could do the cohort? Are you running like 
some kind of A-B test before to gather empirical data and then using that data to build a model? Yeah, yeah, we have quite a bit of data that we've collected over the years through A-B tests. So we have a whole bunch of randomized data that we're using to, to build these models. Yeah, yeah besides that, um, at each, uh, each time stamp of the whole uh, process, um, in general, uh, the ideal scenario will be to also collect some random data, collect some uh, exploration data. And of course, how much exploration data we collect at a further time point is TBD. And uh, that also presents itself a trade-off between exploration and uh, exploitation. Right, you can imagine like in whatever population we're running this on, maybe you cut out 10% of that population and just assign them random stuff at any point in time just for a comparison group and for also collecting more data. Cool. All right. So now I'll briefly touch on some broader applications of this. Um, it can be used, uh, like we've been saying, in basically any setting where personalized optimization uh, would be beneficial. Right? So you can imagine this would work very well in online advertising, where maybe you have some set of advertisements that you need to pick which one to show to each user. That would be a very straightforward case where contextual bandits would be useful. Another case, like I said before, email optimization, right? If you have to figure out which subject lines to send to somebody, which specific email template to send to somebody, um, these are all cases where contextual bandits would be useful. Um, and lastly, you could even you know, widen that scope to just content recommendation as a whole. You know, anytime you have some piece of content, you have users and you have to decide how to you know, allocate content to users or assign content to users, contextual bandits can help you do that in a personalized way. It is important to note here that, you know, specifically with content recommendation, if your action space gets really, really large, like to the point where you have hundreds of thousands or millions of actions, then these contextual bandit approaches may begin to fail you. Uh, they do better in smaller action spaces. Once you get to these super large action spaces, you might be better served by a more classical recommendation system. Um, but any, any situation where your action space is relatively small um, or reasonably sized, contextual bandits uh, should be very helpful. And again, all of these fall under the bucket of personalization. So the very last thing we wanted to touch on is to kind of preview this Python package that we're developing that will <coughs> capture a lot of this functionality that we've been working on. Um, it'll be called OptimLift. It's a Python package that will include, among other things, functionality for contextual bandits. So you can think of it as you know, being kind of a one-stop shop for any sort of contextual bandit functionality that you'll have. Um, you can build your own CMEB agents, apply it to whatever use case you have. Um, we'll build in tools for you to run your own simulations to get a sort of proof of concept down because that is kind of a, a barrier here to entry is that it's hard to show the value of this without actually doing it because you have to collect all this data in real time and you can't really test that without actually doing it. Um, and so that's where simulations are useful because then you can, you can do it without actually spending the money or using the resources to run it in production. Um, so we'll build all this out in a Python package. We're working on it. It's not out yet, um, but keep your eyes peeled for that in the future. Um, and yeah, that is all. That's contextual multi-arm bandit. So any questions are welcome. people and bringing in people, is it dynamic in that sense where it will change the nature of the cohort in order to fix the influx of people? That's a really good question. That's something that we're still kind of playing around with. Um, there's a couple different ways you can sort of handle the, you know, the dynamic movement of people from cohort to cohort. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. It's, it's like a, it's a challenging problem that I'm thinking through right now. Um, but, yeah, there's a couple ways to do it. For the sake of this talk, we'll 
leave it at that. If you want to talk more about it after, we can go into details. Um, but yeah, good question, though. It's a very relevant problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if there is, if, if uh, we're separating people into cohorts, right? Like, is there a comparison between other clustering techniques and CMAP? Yeah. Um, I did actually play around with some more standard clustering approaches, like, like a simple k-means clustering, instead of you know using this whole model and uh, clustering based on the output of the model. And these unsupervised clustering approaches generally did not yield as good performance as uh, the model clustering did. Um, I don't have a real explanation as to why, other than that the model is you know, it's directly modeling the things that we're interested in. And so naturally, if you cluster people based on that, I think it makes logical sense that those clusters would perform better than something that is unsupervised. Um, but yeah, the performance was better. We did touch that. And also, we use the clustering here just as an example. So think about uh, the other two um, uh, popular methods of doing contextual MAB, CMAB. We can apply um, all of those into our contextualization steps. A little bit relevant to the first question, but like, does the model uh, increasingly handle the uh, data drift or like a concept drift? It would be handled in like retraining, right? It wouldn't just be like this model that you fit once and just leave it there, right? It's gonna, we're gonna iterate on it. So theoretically, if the distribution of the data does start to move around, that should be captured in when the model's retrained. That's why um, having a contextualized explore, uh, exploration uh, layer is important. Yeah, so that we know when does the current uh, contextualization fail to perform, and then we need to retrain and rebuild. Yep. Yeah, kind of a wild question, but like to the content personalization that you were talking about, and kind of like pulling down that action space, mm -hmm. do, you, do you know anything about like any kind of like methods that are being used, you know, because it's really yeah. tricky, like, you know, Image yeah, yeah, there are, I read a couple papers that uh, describe different ways of condensing that action space down into something that's reasonable so that you can apply a contextual bandit. Uh, they're fairly complicated. Um, and I don't know if, I don't remember if they actually showed superior performance to like a more classical recommendation system that's kind of designed for large action spaces. But to answer your question, yes, there are approaches that do that. They're interesting. I can point you to some papers if you're interested. Um, it's it's cool, but it's it's challenging to do. It's it's not a straightforward problem to do that. But yeah, good question. Yeah. Is the success of the intervention measured by conversion? Generally, not long-term behavior change. Yeah, yeah. Like in the in the example of the emails, yes, it's measured in terms of open rate. So but if you wanted to measure that behavior change long term, mm -hmm. this probably isn't mm -hmm. a good application. It's more like comparing, like comparable maybe. Well, it's it's relevant for long term behavior change in the sense that like opening the email is the first step in that behavior change funnel, right? Like if they, if they don't open the email, they're not going to see the content or do anything, right? Um, of course, it's not completely reflective of behavior change because even once they open the email, they have to consume the rest of the content, do whatever the action is and so on, right? So there's more steps in that funnel. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of just like a small piece of that puzzle, but um, I wouldn't say it's totally irrelevant, but you are right, it's not, it's not quite like this. It's not the be all end all metric for behavior change. But the methodology is definitely applicable to a long term, uh, like a medical cost saving type of uh, uh, metrics. Yeah, we just needed to optimize our rewards towards that. Yeah, and of course, um, I would say uh, multi-arm bandit and the contextual multi-arm bandit uh, is best, best applicable to digital experiments that have a, a shorter feedback loop than like uh, you have to wait for a few months, a half, half a year, a year to observe, um, you know, the next set of uh, state. Cool. All right.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.